Hi, I'm Louis Rosenberg, and today I'm going to talk about mixed reality, the future of computing, and I'm going to give a 30-year perspective. And let me start off with a prediction. I believe that by 2032, less than a decade from now, uh, lightweight, stylish, and powerful mixed reality eyewear will replace the mobile phone as our primary interface to our digital lives. Uh, now, that's a bold statement, but I really do believe it. Um, of course, for this to occur, we need to have a few events to happen. Uh, first, we need quality consumer products that provide mixed reality to be available. Not, not perfect, but viable for daily use in public places. Um, next, we need a rapid adoption phase, uh, so let's say from 2026 to 2031, uh, which means that useful content will be everywhere you go. And, and I think that Apple, Google, Meta, and others will ensure that this is the case uh, during this period. And then finally, we will achieve market dominance uh, around 2032. And, and by market dominance, I mean that people will spend more time accessing their digital lives through mixed reality than through handheld mobile phones. And, and in fact, we, we will reach this point where we will look back at old movies where people are walking down the street, staring down at phones, bumping into things as, as ridiculous. And, and it will look, look ridiculous because the right way to interact with information is just spatially all around us. And, and so uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to explain why I believe this future is inevitable. Uh, also, uh, during this talk, I'm going to talk about the risks of uh, a mixed reality world that we need to think about as this future approaches. And, and I'll show a quick uh, two minute video that I helped produce that shows these dangers vividly. Uh, it's called Privacy Lost. Uh, but most of all, uh, what I want to do over this, this talk is convey that this shift from, from desktop and mobile computing to mixed reality or, or spatial computing, as Apple calls it, is not just about creating a new user interface for society. It's about creating a new reality where our physical lives and our digital lives merge into a single experience, a single reality. And this will be our next reality. And in fact, I want to take this opportunity to, to give a shameless plug for a new book I have coming out uh, from Hachette with co-author co the great Alvin Graylin uh, called Our Next Reality. Uh, the book is about our future, specifically our AI-powered immersive future. Uh, it's structured as a debate where Alvin covers the positive potential uh, and I cover the risks that we need to think about to prepare for this future, especially around the, the AI aspects. Um, and the goal is to help drive this field towards positive outcomes. Uh, the forward of the book is written by the legendary Neil Stevenson, and we have uh, many industry luminaries who contributed uh, small pieces throughout the book. And so, so I'm excited. Uh, just recently went live on Amazon for pre-order. And so if you like the, the content in this uh, presentation, you might check it out. Uh, the book covers a lot of ground as both Alvin and I have been working in the fields of, of VR and AR and AI for over 30 years each and we each bring those experiences onto the page. As for my background, I began working in VR labs at Stanford and NASA back in 1991, uh, studying depth perception in early vision systems and, and doing early research into haptic interfaces. I was immediately convinced that immersive experiences is the future of computing. Uh, I was captivated by VR and the potential, but spending lots of time programming and testing, I felt like there was a major barrier that stood in the way of mainstream use, uh, namely that you were cut off from your surroundings. Um, in fact, I was lucky to do a lot of human testing where I would bring in people to, to uh, experience uh, things and give me feedback about depth perception. And I could tell that people liked quick demos the first time they experienced uh, VR, but nobody acted like they could use this technology for long periods of time. Um, and, and neither did I. And, and what I really wanted was to take the power and magic of VR and just merge it with the real world around us so that you could reach out and interact with content right in front of you on your desk or in your workplace or, or anywhere. And, and so I pitched that idea to the U.S. Air Force. And I was lucky enough to get funded to go to Air Force Research Laboratory in 1992 and, and develop a, a mixed reality platform called the Virtual Fixtures uh, System. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, to give some some of my experiences uh, going back 30 years. Um, I uh, I founded 
uh, Immersion Corporation, one of the early VR companies back in 1993, and uh, we focused on uh, on special user interfaces to to give these mixed reality experiences for for medical simulation and training and other environments where uh, people could reach out and interact uh, with uh, real medical instruments and simulated surgical content to train people to perform procedures, and and that was uh, again very. Uh, very convincing to me that, that merging the real and the virtual is so important. And I founded an early augmented reality company called Outland Research uh, that worked on spatial, uh, uh, geospatial technologies and, and uh, interface technologies for, for augmented reality, mixed reality. And um, that was a great experience. And most recently uh, in 2014, uh, almost a decade ago, I founded an artificial intelligence company uh, called Unanimous AI that focuses on um, using AI not to replace people, but to connect groups of people together and amplify their intelligence, both in traditional computing and ultimately in, in virtual and augmented worlds as well. Um, and so all these experiences together, uh, a virtual reality, augmented reality, and, and artificial intelligence really, again, points me towards this next reality that will combine all three and it will change computing in a big way. So back to this prediction, I've written many articles that express that this uh, this view that mixed reality will uh, replace mobile mobile computing uh, in the next eight years or so. And I often get pushback uh, from people who say, well, what about Google Glass? Uh, the concept was tried and it failed a decade ago. And, and I then need to remind them, well, Google Glass was not mixed reality. Uh, it was not even augmented reality. It was smart glasses. Uh, which is a cool concept and, and has real uses, uh, but it's also not a new concept. It goes back to the to the 1940s and 1950s in a concept called head-up displays. Um, in fact, uh, this this shows a, uh, a head-up display from 1955 uh, from the the U.S. Navy, and, and in fact, it was really the first sophisticated head-up display. Uh, there was a transparent TV screen with content on it uh, for targeting for radar. Um, this was Google Glass. Uh, but you could look with both eyes uh, and use the plane instead of uh, instead of uh, an eyepiece. Again, it's a super cool concept, but it wasn't augmented reality. It wasn't mixed reality. It wasn't uh, putting things into your direct environment. It was it was basically annotating or or augmenting your view, uh, not your reality. And uh, and it's really useful concept for specific verticals like flying planes, but it's not a tool for mainstream computing. And uh, unfortunately, because the media and the press have uh, kind of mangled the definitions of, of what is augmented reality, what is mixed reality, um, we end up with some people being very skeptical about a technology space that they shouldn't be skeptical about. They, they actually probably haven't even experienced it for real. They are thinking about things that are uh, really predecessor technologies. And so this brings me to this issue of, of definitions. The fact is the language has shifted over the decades. Uh, some of these words uh, have uh, have gotten watered down. Augmented reality, for example, got watered down over the years, um, starting from truly immersive 3D interactive experiences, got watered down uh, with respect to Google Glass, got watered down also with respect to, to mobile phones and, and flat images. Um, Virtual reality also got watered down. Uh, you know, it started out really was fully immersive experiences, and now sometimes we blur the boundary with um, 3D social platforms on flat screens. And so the question is, well, what are the right definitions to use now? And I've actually gravitated to uh, some new definitions that came out maybe about a year ago from the from the United States uh, Government Accountability Office, the GAO. Uh, and also the XR Association has uh, has similar definitions, and uh, and I think they're helpful just so we at least know what we're talking about. So here are the definitions. Uh, virtual reality is the easy one. A user is immersed in an interactive, digitally generated environment that replaces or includes the real world. And by immersed, we really mean spatially. So using a flat screen is technically outside the definition. That's that's 3D simulation or first-person gaming. Uh, but virtual reality, I think, is is not confused that often. Um, then augmented reality is defined as an immersive system in which a user views static digital information or visual elements integrated into the real environment. Uh, I would stress that integrated means spatially registered. It's it's spatially in the real environment. It's not just laid on top of it. That's smart glasses. And then there's mixed reality, which is uh, which really takes that one step further. It's enabling users to reach out and interact 
with responsive and immersive virtual elements integrated spatially into the real world. And to me, that is the future of computing, mixed reality. It's not annotating a view of your world. It's not adding flat overlays. Uh, it's eliminating the perceptual boundaries between the real and the virtual. So there's just one reality, one world, which is physical and digital, and we will just interact with it as if it's that's just the world. And so um, this is a, you know, an example of mixed reality. And you should forget what's digital and what's virtual. You should just work and, and, uh, and it's there in your space. Uh, this is mixed reality. Uh, and again, medical space has been really at the forefront of this, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more uh, later. But again, the content is just there in the place that you want it. This is mixed reality. Um, content is there, not taking people out of the real world. Um, and so ultimately, you know, I believe mixed reality is inevitable. It's inevitable because it presents information to the human perceptual system in the form that we were meant to receive it, spatially, as immersive experiences all around us. Why is this inevitable? Because it's, it's in our DNA. This is how we evolved to understand our world. This is how we evolved to explore our world. It's how we evolved to, under, to remember our world. Uh, we remember things spatially. People who are the best uh, memory athletes on the planet, they do something called a memory palace where they visualize things spatially because that's how our brain works. And most of all, it does not cut you off from your physical surroundings, from the people and places of, and things in your life or in your workspace. Um, and I can't stress how important this is. Um, and in fact, I want to take just a, a, a few minutes just to take you back in time and, and talk about the first time I had ever experienced this, uh, first time I had ever experienced a true mixed reality. So as I mentioned earlier, I was working in uh, uh, virtual reality labs at, at Stanford and then at, at NASA. And um, I was uh, extremely captivated by the power of VR but I wanted to, to take it out of the, the headset and put it out into the world. And I had uh, pitched that idea to the U.S. Air Force, and um, and that turned into what became the Virtual Fixtures Project. And uh, and so there I am in 1992 uh, testing, uh, doing experiments, early uh, mixed reality experiments, and, uh, and create what ultimately became a system where uh, I could put virtual objects into your space that you could not just interact with, but actually feel, uh, physically feel in full three-dimensional space, uh, also had three-dimensional audio, uh, spatial audio. Um, the, uh, the original concept that I had pitched to the Air Force was, uh, was for surgery. In fact, the reason it was called virtual fixtures was the idea of, okay, imagine you're a surgeon and you're performing a, an operation and you wanna make an incision. Um, you can do that freehand or you can use some kind of uh, fixture, physical fixture that could guide your hand or prevent you from, from going too deep. And, and the concept was, well, what if that could be a virtual fixture? All right, see the real patient, um, perform a procedure, have uh, have visual cues, have but, that you, but things you can also feel uh, so that it would actually guide your scalpel, prevent you from going too deep. Uh, and I often compared a virtual fixture to, to it's like a ruler in the real world. You know, a ruler is a really simple fixture. It can help you draw a straight line. Uh, you can draw a straight line much better than you can ever do it freehand and it reduces a lot of your mental effort uh, and so you can perform faster and so this idea was well what if we could do that in in the real world with virtual fixtures that you could see and feel and interact with and um, and enhance performance and so that was the goal of of this project uh, the we weren't going to build a system for uh for surgery uh, back in 1992 uh, so the idea was to prove the concept uh, with a a test of human performance. And there's a standard test called a Fitz Law task, which uh, quantifies human performance. And it's uh, it usually involves taking a, um, a peg and moving it between holes of different distances and asking people to perform it as fast as they can and and uh, and seeing uh, and, and actually quantifying their 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 skill, their performance, their dexterity. And the idea of the virtual fixtures project was to say, okay, what if, what if I could have people perform this task, but then create a variety of these uh, virtual fixtures that would be added to the environment and allow them to put, to perform the task with greater skill. And so uh, some of these fixtures were uh, were flat planes or, or series of flat planes that you would literally feel when, when you 
peg bumped into it, you would it would feel extremely real as you're performing the task. Uh, some became more uh, more sophisticated cones and and textures you would feel. Uh, some of them actually involved spatial audio. And so this was the idea of a virtual fixture project. People would come in and uh, and they would perform the task. Uh, this is uh, a really short video. Um, Actually, I don't think this has ever been seen before because I had to actually buy an old VC, an, an old camcorder on eBay and you to actually get access to this this very very old video, a uh, 30 year old camcorder, and it just shows uh, again some this is uh, somebody interacting, uh, full 3D objects that they can feel as they engage, and it worked and it allowed people to perform significantly better in in many cases uh, almost twice as fast in performing these these tests. Uh, some of the experiments were also uh, telepresence related where what if I'm controlling a remote robot say up in orbit and there's a time delay can I put fixtures in that would allow you to perform better and it, it turns out that, that you could and so uh, so that was a virtual fixtures project it was the, really the first time I'd ever experienced a, a, an environment where I could see and feel and, and hear um, the real world merged with virtual objects that seemed uh, seemed realistic despite uh, low fidelity compared to today's uh, today's world uh, and what's exciting is that you know, this, this early concept of, uh, of virtual fixtures, of, of really of mixed reality for medical, is really one of the first fields that's, that's being deployed uh, just, uh, just this year. Uh, mixed reality, uh, the first mixed reality system got FDA approval for deployment in, uh, in surgical suites, in, in operating rooms. This is a system from MetaView. Uh, they're one of a number of companies uh, that, that are doing this. And... Um, it's really happening, and it will become, I believe, central to to all surgical uh, all surgical uh, operations. Um, uh, and so, uh, really, you know, f from uh, from my perspective, it's been really exciting to watch uh, this field evolve over the last thirty plus years. Uh, this is a picture of me from 1992, and then a picture of me from uh, from 2022. And, and uh, the reason this picture was created was to show how the technology has has refined so much. You know, back in 1992, obviously, it's a crazy amount of hardware, and 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 most of the hardware is not even shown in this image. There's um, there's multiple computers running, you know, full full big computers. In uh, on the other side is uh, the uh, the Meta Quest Pro, the computers inside the headset. All the trackings inside the, the hand controllers and the, and the headset, and um, you know, everything is has been shrunk down remarkably over the last uh, over the last 30 years. I mean, it's it's mind-boggling. Um, which brings me back to my you know, the prediction from the beginning, which was that by 2032, again, I really do believe that lightweight, stylish, powerful mixed reality eyewear will replace the mobile phone as the primary interface for our digital lives. Again, it requires. Uh, next generation hardware that is that is smaller and lighter but there are devices today uh, from HTC uh, from Apple uh, from Meta that provide quality mixed reality experiences uh, other companies Magic Leap and um, there's lots of efforts to make this technology uh, lighter and cheaper which again is why I believe that if the f these first next generation products come out in 25 26 we still have uh, substantial time before that to happen uh, we could see this rapid adoption period and then market dominance. And, and some people say, well, why is it going to, why, why would it only take six years, five years to, to go from first consumer products to, to market dominance? And, and I say, uh, there's a really good example of this, which is the iPhone, right? When the iPhone came out, uh, 2007, nobody thought they needed a smartphone. Nobody thought they would spend, you know, 500 to $1,000 on a smartphone. People thought phones were for making for making phone calls, and um, when the iPhone came out, it was early adopters. Um, but suddenly there was content that you could not experience if, unless you had a smartphone. And so over a very short period of time, five or six years, uh, people felt like they were missing out if they didn't have a smartphone. They they were not being able to access the same information that other people were accessing. And and it only took six years to go from that iPhone moment until the majority, more than 50% of phones sold were smartphones. I think the same, uh, the same dynamic will, will happen with mixed reality uh, glasses, headsets, uh, where uh, if you're walking down the street and you're wearing a, a mixed reality uh, glasses and you can see content and information uh, that other people can't access with a traditional phone or, or it's very awkward to access it, they will feel like they're missing out. And it will be that same dynamic. And, uh, and that suggests that within just five or six years, 
uh, from that first iPhone moment you know, of a quality mixed reality, uh, low cost um, headset, adoption can happen very, very quickly. So I really think that's going to happen. It's worth mentioning the dangers as well, um, just because I really do believe this will happen. And, and the dangers is that when mixed reality goes mainstream, platforms that control these devices could have the ability to track what you do, where you go, who you're with, what you look at, because they need to know, need to know all that information as you're moving through worlds. And they can even track how you feel while doing it, uh, because these devices uh, will be able to track uh, probably your, your facial expressions, eye motion, pupil dilation, and, and other physical qualities that, um, that will determine uh, your emotions. And so we're headed towards a world, especially with the recent power of, of AI, uh, that will have these devices will have the ability to do extensive behavioral tracking and profiling of users, uh, knowing how people behave uh, over time. Uh, extensive emotional tracking and profiling of users, knowing how people react to different situations in their life over time. And those things combined can be used to, to deploy targeted influence on, on people in their world that's far more persuasive than today's influence. In this mixed reality world, targeted influence will happen in real time, will be AI powered. And to convey what, this, what these dangers are like, um, I, uh, I produced a short video called Privacy Lost. Um, it was uh, funded by uh, Mindaroo Foundation, Responsible Metaverse Alliance, XR Guild, um, and it was really great to get their support. And it's the short two minute video that visually conveys the interactive dangers when mixed reality and artificial intelligence, AI agents are widely deployed. Uh, just so we can start thinking about these dangers and, and planning the, the solutions for those dangers. And so with that, I will, uh, I will show the video. You know, I'm playing golf with Robert then. This weekend? Are you serious? What did I say? I mean, he invited me, I couldn't say no. Besides, I told you last week. Warning. I'm sorry. I thought I told you last week. Well, you want me to cancel? No, really, you want me to cancel? I'll make up some story. It's fine. Really? You'll cancel? As soon as we get home. Warning. Warning. What? I told you I'd cancel. Yeah, that's what you said, but... Hello, happy family. I hope you guys are hungry. Can I get some appetizers started? Maybe. What's good after a long, sweaty day of surfing? After a long, hot day of surfing, I'd go for the Samoan lobster roll. It's a bit pricey, but it's worth it. Purchase probability rising. You know what? We'll take two. YOLO, right? We have a lovely dark whiskey from Kawi that you might like. Absolutely. You know, you read my mind. And what about you, little man? What? Put on your collins. You know what my favorite drink is? The Volcano Milkshake. Scotty, just get apple juice. Your name is Scotty? It's my name too. High five. Please, Mom, please. He will love you most of all. Purchase probability rising. I'll let him get the volcano shake. Alert. Alert. Actually, make that whiskey a double. Mm -hmm. You want the shake, right? Yeah. We're out for dinner. So that's Privacy Lost. Um, if you want to tell people about it, they can go to privacylost.org um, and there's uh, some information about it and links to the video itself on YouTube. Uh, with all that said, uh, just some closing thoughts. Again, I firmly believe that mixed reality is the future of computing. I think it's inevitable because it's how our brains want information spatially 
integrated into our natural experiences, not cut off from the real world. Uh, mixed reality also has the potential to be dangerous uh, because it's powerful. Uh, it can track you, profile you, and change the world around you. And there needs to be uh, regulations and protections, uh, especially uh, as we integrate AI into these mixed reality systems uh, with AI agents, because we don't want this to become a tool of persuasion. Uh, Privacy Lost gives a, a, uh, a harmless example of artificial agents uh, reading your emotions and um, and persuading you to, to upsell you. Uh, but those same techniques and tactics could be used for de delivering misinformation, uh, propaganda, and um, and it's very it's very dangerous. And then finally, um, I think now is the time for us to push for protections in immersive worlds, especially in mixed reality environments, because it's coming soon. Uh, this will happen. I really do believe 2032. We will look back. And uh, at the time when people were staring down at phones and thinking this is primitive, information should just be around us. And so uh, that's mixed reality, the future of computing. Uh, I'm Louis Rosenberg. Uh, there's my email if uh, if anyone wants to reach out. And uh, if these if these topics are interesting to you, um, I point you towards uh, our new book that uh, that's now available for pre-order. Our next reality, it it digs into all these issues uh, in in even more detail. Thanks.